Great. Thibault, we're ready. Yes, All I right. am. Um, so, welcome everyone. Um, as I said, I'm going to show you how to turn your existing database into a GraphQL API with Prisma and Nexus. Um, more than that, I want to, to show you how to do it uh, while skipping all the boilerplates that come with uh, traditionally building an API. Um, so, to do that, I'll take uh, an example that could happen in real life. For example, let's say that you work for a company which is called International Shipping Incorporated, and you deliver packages across the world 24-7. Um, so, you, have al you already have a database with uh, millions of references and history entries where you, um, where, where you know where your packages are in where warehouse and everything. But the thing is, you, don't, you do not have a public tracking API, which means that your clients, the recipients of the packages, have no idea where the packages they trusted you to deliver is. And while well, it's nearly 2020, you have to give transparency to your clients. Um, your clients need to know where the package is, in which warehouses, and when did it arrive there. <coughs> so um, here's the existing database you have. You have a package with an ID, a reference, and content. Uh, it's linked to a warehouse uh, where there is a name, an, I, uh, an ID, a name, and an address. And uh, here's uh, how you track the packages. You have uh, tracking info, which links a package to a warehouse using a date time. And you also have the recipient uh, link to packages. So this is the database you have. And during this talk, I want to show you how to turn this database into a public tracking API. And to do that, we will use Prisma and Nexus. Prisma will be used to um, work with the database, and Nexus will be used to, to provide the GraphQL schema and server. So, let's jump onto Prisma. Prisma, um, what is Prisma? Prisma is a tool built by the company with the same name, and it is used to build uh, the data layer of your applications. And uh, I don't know if you heard about it, but last summer, they um, announced that they were starting a big refactoring of their technology um, to build uh, what is now called the Prisma Framework. The Prisma Framework is a set of multiple tools working together uh, to, to work with databases. Um, excuse me for a minute. Um, they help you to access, migrate, and develop uh, with databases um, whatever the technology you use for the, your databases. Currently, they um, can work with PostgreSQL, um, MySQL, SQLite, and there is more to come, including MongoDB. Um, in the heart of this architecture, you can see that there is a Prisma schema. So the Prisma schema is used to define the structure of your data and it will be used by all the other tools of the Prisma framework to, to know how to work with your database. Um, at the moment, they are working on three tools. So first there is Photon, then there is Studio, and Lyft. So Photon. Photon is an auto-generated um, database client um, for JavaScript and TypeScript. And, um, you can consider it, consider it an ORM, or RM, but uh, it's more accurately described as a query builder for your database. Uh, we'll talk more about that later. Then there is Lyft. Um, Lyft he can access your Prisma schema, and um, it connects to it and the database, and it will generate a safe and resilient database migration every time your schema changes. So um, you don't have to manually access the database, you just need to change the schema, uh, change how you structure your data, and the Prisma framework with Lyft will, uh, do the, will change the structure of your databases for you. And finally, there is Studio, which is um, intended to be uh, a database IDE, so um, you can access and edit the data during the development phase and uh, maintenance phases of your applications. So, here is what a Prisma schema looks like. So, the first part is the generator, but we'll talk about that later. 
Then there is the data source. In the data source, you, it, it is used to um, explain to Prisma framework how to access your database. Um, here it's a PostgreSQL database and there is also the URL to access it. And finally, here is what's important. It's all the models of your application. For example, here is two models, a book and an author. Each model uh, has a list of attributes. Um, for example, the book has an ID string, an ESBN string, a title string, etc. Um, each attribute can either be a scalar, so a string, number, a boolean, etc., or a re um, another model, in which case it creates a relation. Here we have a book which has an author and author which has a list of books. Um, attributes can also have directives, so you can see that on the ESBN um, string in the book, there is the at unique directives. It says that uh, in your database, you cannot have two books with the same ISBN string. Um, so, yeah, um, there is two ways to create... Um, so, this is a Prisma schema, but how do we get one? There is two ways to get one. The first way is to manually write it. Um, for example, if you are building a completely new application with an empty database, you can manually write the schema, and uh, Lyft will, uh, will shape the database accordingly to the schema, and that's great for building new application. But in our case, in our example, when we already have a schema, uh, already have a database, we don't want to manually write the schema because uh, we maybe are going to be going to do typos or we're going to miss relationships or directives, etc. Uh, fortunately, Prisma thought about that, and so they did what is called introspection. So introspection, it's um, it's where Prisma is going to look at your database. So here uh, we have the pre-existing PostgreSQL database with uh, different tables. And after looking at it, it will generate the schema, Prisma schema accordingly. So as you can see, here's a subset of it. We can see the package, warehouse, recipients. Um, it found everything in uh, the different models, uh, including the relationships. So we have the package linked to a warehouse, tracking info, the recipient. And more than that, it also found uh, directives. For example, the at unique directives on the reference. Um, because in our database, we have an index on the reference, so two packages have uh, different references. And it found that, in, it put that in the Prisma schema. So, great, now we have the schema. What's left to do is to really access the data. And to do that, we will use Photon. So, as I told you before, this is the generator part. Um, the generator part of the schema will um, ask Prisma to generate the uh, database client every time the schema changes. And here is how you use it. Um, after instantiating it, you can do photon.packages.find1 where reference ABC123 and there we go. We have uh, my back, which is uh, uh, in a package. Um, because as I told you, Photon is generated. Uh, we can access all the great feature of TypeSafe uh, using TypeScript and uh, also auto-completion. Because um, we don't have to rewrite all the types, they are already generated in Photon. If we want, uh, here we can see that we only have the scalars example, so we only have the ID content reference. If we want the relations, we can do that by asking Photon to include them. Uh, so here I include the warehouse and the tracking info, and in the tracking info I also ask to include the warehouse. And here we go, we can see that my bike is currently in London, it arrived there yesterday evening, and before that it was in Hong Kong. Great. Um, yeah, so Right now, we have uh, pretty good access to our database, and uh, just with that, we can do a REST API, and yeah, that would be great. But we aren't um, exploiting the full potential of Prisma, and to do that, we'll use the second step, Nexus. So, before I talk about Nexus, um, here is how we traditionally create a GraphQL server. First, we define the SDL, a book, 
with the title authoring, and uh, we also have the query where we have a book uh, which returns an array of book. Then we write the resolvers, so here's the resolver for books, and then we build the schema. So the building the schema is doing it by um, merging the SDL and the resolvers. We have the schema, we put it to Apollo server or the like, and there we have it. This is called the SDL first approach. Um, but there is some issue with this approach. For example, um, there could be inconsistencies. Uh, let's say that I made a typo when I wrote the resolver name between uh, the SDL and the resolver, or maybe um, sometimes my, my resolver uh, returns new label, new, a new value, while my SDL said that it shouldn't. And uh, fortunately for us, there is a solution. You can use static, static analysis or code generation. But then we also have a problem of the moduli modularization. Uh, if you want to uh, split your schema into smaller components to reuse them across uh, your API, well, we also have a solution. It's called GraphQL models. But what if we want to import uh, a schema file into another schema file? Fortunately for us, there is also a solution, GraphQL import. And to do composition um, of multiple schema, well, there is schema teaching, federation, and what about tooling and IDE support? Well, there is the VED Scott plugin, GraphQL tag. But I think, I guess you, you're starting to see the pattern here. Um, Every time we, we are fixing a problem with a tool, we are introducing new problems, which we are then fixing with other tools, and it looks like workarounds on workarounds on workarounds. And um, so the people at, at Prisma, um, they, took a, they took a step back and they started thinking, well, um, don't, can't we have a solution that could solve all of these problems for us, and that's when they, they found the solution, and we already have it, and it's our programming languages. And if you use a programming languages that uh, is type safe, for example, TypeScript or Go, well, you could fix all of these problems because um, programming languages already have all of this solution. Well, and this is called the code first approach. I'm not going to go too much in the, into the SDL first and code first uh, approach. If you want to learn more about it, I um, st strongly suggest you read more about it in the article, The Problems of Schema First GraphQL Server Development, um, made by Nicholas Burke from Prisma, um, as well as watching his uh, ama amazing talk, uh, which is called Code First GraphQL Server Development with Prisma from which this slide is from. Um, anyway, so, as I told you, the people at Prisma um, started thinking that the code-first approach was a better solution to fix all of these issues, and so they wrote Nexus. Nexus is a library, library that helps you create a graphical schema using this approach. Here is how it works. First, you define your types, you write your types um, using, for example, TypeScript here. So uh, we have the book and uh, we have a definition of a title, which is a string, and author, which is also a string. Then we write uh, the queries. So we also have books, which uh, will return a list of type book, and we also return an array of books uh, here. Winds of Winter by George R. R. Martin, maybe one day. Um, Strange Planet from Nathan W. Pyle. And then we build the schema. So this time, um, we only give the types, uh, including the query type. And it's going to be Nexus that is going to generate the um, SDL. So it's, uh, you are not writing it manually. It's going to be a generated artifact based on what you wrote. And, you, and it's going to be um, really fiddle to, to, to how you wrote it without typos, and this is what it's going to look like. Um, if we want a more complex example, because it was really easy, let's say that you have a, you know have an author um, type which is uh, as the same as a book type, and uh, we also want to separate uh, 
uh, the data into two arrays uh, to look more like a database. So we have the books data and author data. This time we have to link them, uh, and we are doing this in the resolver um, resolver of the author field in the book type. We take the author ID and we find the author based on the ID. And the same as before, it gener generated the schema. Um, so uh, that's great, but <coughs> since we already have the Prisma schema uh, and the generated photon clients, don't we already have all the information we need about the types, the attributes, and the relations? And if so, couldn't we use this uh, directly with Photon so we don't have to rewrite them ourselves? We don't want to say again that uh, we have a reference which is a string, we have uh, an ID which is a string, and etc. And well, thanks for asking, because we have that. And um, it's called the Nexus Prisma plugin. So while, doing, while, <coughs> while using Nexus Prisma, it's going to connect to Photon, which is itself generated from the Prisma schema. So it uh, already has access to how our data looks like. And here we can do, for example, t.model.reference or t.model.content. And it already knows that uh, it's a string, and uh, it cannot return an empty value. And uh, we, if we want to do relations, we can also do that by doing t.model.warehouse. And it's going to figure itself what is the type and how to link them, so we don't have to think about that. And in the end, we can concentrate on what's important, which is, um, we, which is our business logic. Because from the start of this talk, I told you we want one thing a tracking API when we give the reference, and then when we have the reference, we want to show the package. And so we do that here um, in doing photon.packages.find one. As you can see, there is no uh, include this time because we don't have to manually say that we want uh, the warehouse and the tracking infos and etc. because because um, it's a GraphQL schema, and if the client asks for more, then it's going to link itself. Uh, it's going to link to other um, types itself, and there we have it. Here, I'm doing a track uh, to reference ABC one two five. I'm asking the reference, uh, the content, the warehouse, tracking info, etc. And I can see that my MacBook Pro is currently in Paris. It arrives there yesterday afternoon, and before that, it was in Hong Kong and London. Yes, so. You users can now use your APIs to track their package, and um, in a matter of minutes, we used Prisma to, um, to introspect your database and find the structure and to, to generate the schema. And then we used Photon to access the data, and we used Nexus to generate uh, the graphical schema to, corres to correspond to our database structure. And then we only have to construct concentrate on what's important, our business logic, which is the track uh, query. <laughs> and that's it. So um, this is the end of this talk. I, if you want to have a conversation about uh, Prisma and Nexus or find my slide, um, don't hesitate to check me out on Twitter. And uh, thank you for listening. Great. So are there any questions? Yes, so it's one. The whiskey, the whiskey guy has a question. Uh, yeah, sorry. Hi. Um, is it usually when you have large enterprise database with a lot of legacy things inside, you have a lot of complexity within the, those database? So wouldn't be it breaking the idea of the GraphQL, saying that GraphQL is here to simplify and present some semantic views of the business objects to the client applications. So exposing directly your, all the complexity of your internal database wouldn't be a problem that you will expose all internal IDs and stuff you've been building since years. So I, I, I would say, like, isn't it a bad idea just to say, I have a database, okay, it will be very fast, and I expose all the stuff, but I also expose all the complexity of the database. 
Um, all right, so your question is, uh, if I do this, uh, am I going to expose everything else that I don't want to expose, right? Yeah, and also all the complexities and all the old stuff I don't necessarily need to expose to the user. Yes, um, so if we, if we go back to uh, how our database look like, yep. Uh, Yes, there we are. So, um, as you can see, the, the warehouse, for example, has uh, um, an address and the package has uh, an ID, which is an internal ID. And we don't want that uh, for our users to figure it out because, well, uh, if we put the address on the warehouse uh, and uh, we have an angry client, he's going to come to the warehouse and say, hey, I want my package. And we, do, we don't want that exactly. But um, when I wrote my Nexus uh, code, just uh, here, no, here. Um, as you can see, I only, uh, on the package of a type, I only say that I wanted the reference, the content, and the warehouse. Uh, I didn't show the, the warehouse type, but uh, I didn't put the address. So I specifically um, told Nexus what I want in my GraphQL uh, schema. And uh, because of that, we aren't going to, to find the I internal IDs and address. Uh, in the schema. Um, then the second part of your question was um, the complexities of the structure of your data, which uh, here it was a simple example, it was pretty nice, uh, and maybe in an old database it isn't like that. Um, you can use Nexus to uh, manually do the relations to restructure your data. You can do that. Um, here it was a very really simple example uh, because sometimes you just want to, to provide an API um, uh, that, um, how can I say that? You don't want to, 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 to have a complex, uh, you just want to have your data put out to your public for a prototype or anything. But you can do much more than that. Uh, here, here I use the t.model, but I could do the t field and then in the resolvers uh, use the photon to, to link to another type that uh, is more internal. Okay, thank you. Great, so we will be moving on to the next talk. Thank you so much. Thank you.